Hi, most folks show up. Today's May 30th, 2022. And um, all those that died for this country, we are very thankful for. And the families that lost loved ones in the war, we thank them for allowing their loved ones to fight for this country, for freedom. And around the world to keep freedom going wherever it can be. So we don't forget Memorial Day. It's a day we celebrate those that gave their lives for this country. So, Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, Yeshua. I thank you for all that you're doing in the world. Thank you that you sent your only son. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for being the, the teacher, the comforter, the guide, the one that leads us to all truth. And we rebuke evil in the name of Yeshua everywhere. In Jesus' name. I got a prophetic word, um, a judgment that God is calling for that's going to happen if something happens. <laughs> I'm going to read it in a minute without getting into it. And then I had the craziest vision, and I'm going to explain what that is too. So I have two prophetic things going out today on Memorial Day. So let me start with reading this. I want to read this from the Bible because this has to do with one of the visions. Well, the other one was a prophetic word. It wasn't a vision. But the Lord spoke this to me and Gary. And if we get this and understand this, that our place in the world is not to fix everything, we're called to rebuke, to pray, for souls to be saved, but things are going to play out the way they're going to play out. You can't rebuke revelation and think it's not going to happen. I'm going to say that again. You can't rebuke the book of revelation and think it's not going to happen because you rebuked it in Jesus name. There are things that will play out according to the Bible because it's meant to, and God's going to make sure it does because it is judgment that comes on the earth. I want to thank the person, by the way, that sent me a bunch of these because I laughed when I got them in the mail because if you notice sometimes when I have a bunch of scriptures, I have like napkins in there to turn to the right pages so I don't have to find them each time. I have one of these and that's it. So they sent me a bunch of them and I'm, I'm thankful for all that you do and God understands all that you do and he's very thankful too for the little things that are done. You know, it's like the person... The woman in the, in the Bible that put the two mites in, the two pennies, whatever you want to call them, in the collection. And he said she did more than the rest because it was the last that she had and she gave it into the kingdom of God. He sees all of that. He sees every single little thing that we do that to us is just not a big deal. Like smiling at a neighbor, you know, maybe you don't like them, but you smile at them just to show them that, you know, somebody cares out there. He sees all of that. So don't think that your life is meaningless because every time you bend a knee to pray or you praise the Lord or you rebuke something or your heart goes out, you help somebody. God sees every single thing we do. And this is the difference between the Christians and the non-Christians. He explains it right here in the Bible. And we have to understand this, what he's talking about. We all know the scripture, John three sixteen. I'm going to start from there. I'm going to read up to 21. Take it in what he's telling us here. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Okay. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him would be saved. He that believes on him is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. So anybody that has heard about Jesus and does not believe on him is condemned by God. And this is the condemnation that the light came into the world and the men loved the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. I'm going to say that again. 
The condemnation to them is that the light is in the world. Because Jesus says was here. But they love the darkness more than the light. Because their deeds were evil. They were doing their own thing. They were doing evil things. For everyone that does evil hates the light. That's why they hate us. And neither comes to the light. Least their deeds should be revealed. In other words, they're doing everything on the side, the sneak. They know it's wrong. They do it anyway because they love the darkness. But he that does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God, that they are done in God. So, they love the darkness more than they love the light. And that is not our problem. We can pray for souls to be saved. And when you get an opportunity to witness, you witness. But we can't be so upset with it that it grieves us to the point where we're just so devastated, so depressed about what's going on in the world that we're like non-functioning Christians. So this is where we have to be in our walk with God to be used by the Lord. They love the darkness more than the light. I have it right here on the top. And I went to bed last night. It was 1228. And this is what he said to me. I started to get this. And then I realized he was giving me a word. He's speaking to any state right now that is looking to allow infanticide, which is the murdering of babies up to 28 days after birth. If you choose to murder my babies outside the womb, your land will surely crack. Now, he's specifically talking about California there because California right now, it's in the court system. It already went through one system and was accepted as one more time to go through and then it will become a law. You think you have the right to do whatever you decide and you defy the God who created you and gave each of you life. How dare you come against life in any way and justify it? You do err greatly and will suffer the consequences if you pass this ungodly bill called infanticide. I will take lives if you choose to take lives and continue not only to murder in the womb, but now outside the womb. How much more of an abomination can you choose to do than fake, than take a life of a baby that has been born? Shame on you. And you better be ready, any state who sides with the bill, for you will surely pay the price. That's a heavy thing he's saying there. Bad enough of abortion, but now outside the womb, that's even worse. Okay. And I just wrote this down before I got this. Jesus is watching to see who of us is actually listening, following, and obeying him. He's watching us as his people. He's showing us what we need to do as the body of Christ. Then I got this vision. It was right. It was after I got that, I went to bed and I was laying there and this is what I saw. Okay. I saw myself on a bridge. It was over water. And the first thing came to my mind was the Golden Gate Bridge. I could kind of see, you know, the thing above it. And I saw like a detonator thing. What to me was a detonator thing. And I was there getting upset about it. I have to stop this. I have to stop this. I have to do something to stop this. So I was there. And then all of a sudden, the only way I can describe this, I was physically zoomed out from that spot. And I could feel the sensation of just being sucked back. And it was like very quickly, rapidly, I got sucked way, way back. And I looked and it looked like the bridge was very long and the detonator was way, 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 way ahead of me. And I stood there and I was like, oh, why did I just get zoomed out? What, what, what are you trying to tell me here? What, what, what are you showing me? What's going on here? You know, and as a Christian, I was kind of perturbed about it a little bit. And then I started getting these words and I have to look at them because I keep forgetting what the words were because they didn't make any sense to me whatsoever. I got the words 
Tetra wind flu. Tetra wind flu. And I'm like, what does that mean? Tetra wind flu, tetra wind flu. And I, then I was like out of the vision and I kept saying the word tetra wind flu, tetra wind flu, tetra wind flu. And I was tired. I didn't want to get up out of bed at that point. I was like, I better write this down because I will forget these words. So I went and I wrote them down real quick, tetra wind flu. And then I went back to sleep till the morning time. So I got up and I told Gary, like the vision that I had, and then I got these words. So we started to do a study on these words. And the time frame when we were looking this up was 1247. I happened to look at the clock. It was 1247. So we both looked up the words. The word tetra, okay, it signifies like many small fish. And it, it also means having four parts. Like four atoms. It's representing the Greek word. The number four, meaning fish. And we all know that, okay, the symbol for Christians was basically a fish. All right? I'll go into that a little bit more. But then we looked up the word wind flu, and it's a word. I had no idea it was a word. The word wind flu is a tablet used to treat aches and pains and allergies. And it's just a pill that you can take to help relieve pain. So I started looking further into the fish thing, the Tetra thing, because obviously we know that fish represents Christians. So I went in and I studied it and the word ichthys was the symbol held. It was a most sacred Significance for Christians used to recognize churches and other believers through this symbol during a time when they were faced with persecution in the Roman Empire. So they used it. And what they did when they met up with each other was they would draw half half of the symbol of the fish. And if the other person they met drew the other half, they would they knew that they were both Christians. So it was a way they kept themselves protected and showed that they were Christians. Okay, then I went in a little bit deeper on this, and the Greek letters of the word ichthys comes out, and I can't, I can't say it is too many things to put down, but the meaning of it is, it means Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. So every time that symbol was used, they were saying that Jesus is the Christ, he's the Son of God, and he's the Savior. Okay, so... As we prayed on this, Gary and I, and we just looked different things up, Gary was sitting there, and I have uh, like an Afghan that lays over my table, and it has the Our Father on it. And I came out to him right before he said this to me, and I said, the word that I got, tetra, okay, when flu, means some kind of a protection for the Christians because it deals with saving you from pain and suffering. And that represents Tetra, the fish, the Christians. So God's showing us the Christians are going to be protected somehow, some way from suffering. So then Gary's sitting there and he sees the words, deliver us from evil. He says to me, Lois, I just saw it. It's four words. Deliver us from evil. Tetra means four. Four parts. Deliver us from evil. It's in the Our Father where it says, the Lord prays to deliver us from evil. Keep us safe from the evil one. That's what it's all about. So, he's telling us there, through me being on that bridge and being sucked away from it, whatever, whether it's an explosive, whatever, whatever happens, there, he just removed me from it. And it, and I felt the sensation of it. And I knew what he was doing. I knew he was pulling me away from it. I was way, way far from it. So then he started saying the word, okay, Tetra wind flu. And he was telling me right there, you as a child of mine are going to be delivered from evil. We are delivered from evil. We are not involved with any of that. 
We're delivered from it. And even though it's going to take place on the earth, we are removed from it. Supernaturally, if we have to be. I was involved. I wanted to stop it. And the father was like, no. Zoom her out. I was zoomed out. It was zoomed out like a camera would zoom right out of a picture. And I was physically zoomed out. And I felt the sensation of it all. And then got those words. And the reason I got those words was because God likes to prove himself. So when you get something that you have no clue what it means, and then you look it up, and you find out what it means, it's kind of like, wow. So he's going to deliver us from evil. And we have to stop obsessing over the evil. Because that's what happens. You have the gloomer doomers after you. You have those Christians that are obsessed, obsessed, obsessed. And all they talk about is what Satan does. And they never talk about salvation. They never talk about no deadly thing shall harm us. We're so afraid. We're not supposed to be walking in fear. Because it doesn't matter. This life is meaningless to us. We will be out of here one day and be come back with the Lord. He's showing us even in death. There's beauty. So we have to understand all of that in order to be used in the world. Because if you don't follow Jesus, he just gave me these words, okay? And he's, he's telling me that's what he's trying to do with his people. Jesus is watching to see who was actually listening to him, following him, and obeying him. How do we listen? We, we, we listen by the word. We listen by the prophets, the true prophets. And then we obey and we follow. Are we actually obeying him in the things we do? Are you doing what the Bible tells you to do when you walk with God? Or are you just doing the things that make you feel good? Or the things that you just want to do? There's a lot of things in that Bible that it's telling us we should be doing. And most of the church is not doing it. We're supposed to be loving one another. We're not supposed to be judging each other that way. The judge is the father. We, we get discernment, and there's a difference between discernment and judgment. You might discern something is going on with a person, but you're not the one to point the finger at that person because you're not the judge, and you don't know why they did what they did in the first place because you're not walking in their shoes. So discernment, yes, and you have to make sure it is discernment from God and not your own attitude because you don't like what they're doing. And you want to clean their life up. You can't clean anybody's life up. They have to clean their own lives up. You can't force somebody to follow Jesus. You can't shove Jesus down people's throats. You just tell them in love. They receive it or they don't. And it's not our problem if they don't. And we can't be so upset about evil that's going on out there. It's going to take place. It is happening. We're in the end times and we're going to see it escalate. To such a degree that Antichrist is going to be running the show in many countries. It will not be in America, and there are countries it will not be in. It, it says it in the word, because the same way it says the Holy Spirit is going to take over the earth, it says the same way Antichrist is going to take over the earth. So is everybody getting baptized in the Holy Spirit on the earth? No. So is Antichrist going to take over every country on the earth? No. It's just saying that it's going to go across the whole planet and the seed will be planted where it can be planted. It's the same with the Holy Spirit. The wind will blow the Holy Spirit all around the earth. And who accepts it and receives it, receives it. Who rejects it, rejects it. It says, John three sixteen. as you read on, that those that don't accept Jesus already are condemned. Because the light came into the world and they loved the darkness rather than the light. You see, that's what we're dealing with. So you have to look at it that way. They liked the darkness. It says they loved the darkness more than they loved the light. They love it. They like it. They enjoy it. And they don't care what God says. They don't care what God tells them is right and wrong. They don't care. And that's why they hate us, because we are representation of Jesus and the Father and the truth. And they don't want to hear it. 
It's murder when you kill a baby in the womb. They don't want to hear it because they want to, they don't want the baby. They want to be able to choose after the baby's born whether they're going to keep it or not. If maybe if it has a condition they don't like, they're going to get rid of it because they don't want to deal with it. Maybe it's deformed and they don't want to deal with it. So that life, just because it's, you know, a misfit, <laughs> gets sent to the island for the misfits. Like in, you know, Rudolph. The island of the misfit toys. All the toys that were broken and had missing legs and arms. They all get sent over there. Because they don't want to be dealt with. But meanwhile, there were many children that wanted and would have loved to have those toys. And that's what happened. Santa picks up all the misfits on the island of the misfit toys and puts them all in and gives them out to all the children. And the children love them just as much as they love the other ones. That's the point. Love is love. And love loves everything, whether it's a misfit or not. That's why we're going to Texas. And all the misfits are welcome to come to Texas. We're not going there to make money. We're going there to get the word out about loving one another and the oneness and unity in the body of Christ. Yeah, it's going to cost money. I'll tell you when I know the details. Of course, we have to pay the bill, obviously, to go there. Takes money to get the message out. So it takes people to give, to build safe havens, to build your churches. It takes you to be obedient, like he says. Are you being obedient in everything that you do? Are you listening, following, and obeying? I asked a while back, I forget when it was, I was saying how I used to find dimes all the time. I found dimes until we bought the property. And then I stopped finding dimes. And I said, you know, if everybody just stuck a dime in an envelope and sent it here, it would add up. And I was, I threw it out there for the people to just send a dime. I think I had like five people did it. All the thousands that watched me, nobody did it. I mentioned the other day about if we all even just sent a dollar. Stuck it in an envelope. It would add up. It would help us do the things we have to do for the church. The safe haven. I don't need the safe haven, folks. I have my own safe haven. I'm on an acre of property. I have my own fruit trees. I mean, I'm good to go here. I don't need to do that. Gary and I are the stewards of the day. So we are called to do that. And the Bible says if we don't, we're going to be in trouble for not obeying our calling. So that's part of our calling. So the people have to obey in order for us to do our part too. I don't have the money. I don't personally have the money. If I did, that'd be built already, folks. Because <laughs> I gave everything I had to the Lord. My house I bought, my mother, my father died and left a few dollars to my mother. My mother passed away and left a few dollars to me and my two sisters. All right? That's how I got this house. And I turned it over to the ministry. So I could do his work from it. And to be part of the church, the Lord said, you want me to take care of it? Give it to me. So I gave it to him. I pretty much don't own anything. And I don't really have to. It's like nobody's going to own anything on the property either. The ministry is owned by everybody. We run it. But it belongs to the Lord. It's God's ministry. It's his, not mine. It's not my money that comes into that. It's not a personal salary to Gary and I. It goes in and the funding goes where it's needed to do what it has to do. So everything that's built on there, all the housing and everything that we're all going to live in, it's going to be you come and you stay as our guest. Your guests of the ministry and those that can donate to build a house, fine. Those that can't, fine. But everybody has their gifts and what God has called them to do. And everybody's going to participate and do their part. 
to keep it running. It's going to be just like it was in the book of Acts, where they lived in communities and they all worked together. And they all brought what they had and dropped it at the feet of the disciples. They sold their houses. They sold what they had. They gave it to the disciples. And the disciples distributed it evenly. That can't work unless it's done in, in the spirit of God. And unless the people are willing to do it. Because not everybody will do it. Not everybody's willing to give up what they have. It's mine. Nothing is yours. And God can take it away at any moment in time. That's why you're better off just trusting him with your life. Lay your life down and let him bless you the way he wants to bless you. Because once you do that, he gives you the desires of your heart. But until you do that, usually you wait. When I gave my life up and I truly gave everything to him, he took my husband home. I lost all my children at the time. I almost lost this house, but he made a way for me. I dealt with my health. I, I lost my health. I went through a Job-like experience. But when I came out of that, he gave everything back to me. And what he did was, he started just blessing me with the desires of my heart. He just gave them to me. Gary came into the picture. Just everything started to happen. Because I laid my life down. And I just loved him anyway, and I just kept on going. It's important that we follow and we obey. You can't expect that when the time comes where we have to go to these safe havens, if you've done nothing to help, you can't expect to just show up at the door and say, I'm coming in, when people sacrificed to help build it. It just wouldn't be fair, would it? Yeah, but I don't have any money. Well, I never had any money either, so you can't throw that one in my face. I served God for 50 years with no money. And yet I fed the needy. <laughs> so you can't say that to me. Because every time I gave out of my lack, he blessed me for it, and he gave me what I needed. You can't do that. You can't make that as an excuse for not obeying God. God expects us to obey him. That's how you get blessed. It's in every area. It's in prayer. Maybe there's a time when you want to watch something on the television. The Lord's tugging at your heart to go in your bedroom and pray. And we don't want to do it. Or he's moving you to fast or something. Well, skip your lunch today for me and pray, pray through it. And we don't want to because we want to eat our lunch. He understands it's not condemnation, but if we want to be used in God's ministry and in, in, in the kingdom of God, you have to be willing to get yourself out of the way in every way. That's why I'm on video. That's why he's using me for his glory. That's why he talks to me because I let it all go. And I have no agenda whatsoever in my life. I have no agenda to be famous. I have no agenda to be a prophetess. I have no agenda to be agenda to be anybody, anybody, except what he wants for me. And that's where you need to get. And a lot of people, we're too self, we're too into ourselves still, and we can't just get out of that. But that's where the war comes in. You're learning, learning, learning. And we keep on moving forward. And we trust him in it all. So that's all I have to say. Oh, and I will let you know about Texas. I'm still waiting for, from the brother. I'm actually going to send him an email to see what's going on over there so we can get it out to the people. So that's about all I have to say. Keep the prayers going. Keep rebuking. Keep giving for all the causes. Jay Sekulow and all of those guys out there, they need finances to do what they have to do. The safe havens need finances. Your churches need your tithes um, to, to do what they have to do to keep the ministry going. There's just things you need to do on your part. The, and prayers are the most important because that's what changes things. And I'll end with love one another. All right. I'll be back when he sends me back again. I'm Lois Vogel Sharp. Have a blessed day. Mm -hmm.